And we're some 48 hours away from the opening ceremonies of the Winter Olympics in the Russian resort of Sochi. Welcome back. This is part two of the France Fanquette debate. We're talking about it uh, with, from Moscow, Andrei Kortinov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, here in the studio from sister station Radio France International, Elena Servataz, Andreas Evagora, uh, Deputy Head of News at Eurosport. And we're pleased to welcome for part two of our discussion our Moscow correspondent, uh, Joshua Yaffa. Uh, I'll begin with you, Joshua, in, in, in Moscow. Um, you're very, very far away in terms of kilometers uh, from Sochi, but uh, how, what is the general mood right now in the buildup? I think there's a lot of anticipation uh, for better and worse. In other words, uh, there are some Russians uh, who are excited about these games, uh, excited about what might uh, be shown on the opening ceremonies and, and, and are looking forward to Russia's uh, debut on the, on the world stage in this very public, high-profile way. Uh, there are others uh, who are concerned about costs, concerned about safety, uh, who uh, are, are cringing a little bit uh, for that very same reason that Russia is about to really go under the microscope uh, in front of the whole world. Uh, and so there's certainly no small amount of people here uh, in Moscow who, uh, whether it's a question of the now infamous $50 billion uh, price tag or talk of uh, security and terrorism uh, threats uh, are, are growing a little bit tense uh, now with the games uh, just a few days away. But whether you're excited about the games, anxious about the games, for them, against them, uh, there nonetheless is a shared sense of anticipation at exactly how is it all going to turn out uh, and what will happen down in Sochi just in a few days' time. $50 billion for the games. Uh, let me ask Andre Kortinov this question. Uh, Andre, at that price tag, was it worth it? Well, I think it's difficult uh, to, uh, to ask people about, about whether you know, it's uh, really worth it or not, because people do not feel this money. Uh, it's too big a sum of money for people in the street to, to comprehend. Uh, it's not something that uh, affects them directly. At least they don't see uh, any direct connection between how they live and these uh, mega projects that uh, from time to time uh, are launched by the government. Uh, however, of course, uh, many people are skeptical uh, about the lasting impact uh, of this investment because the official position is that uh, Russians should probably uh, go to Sochi instead of uh, going to Turkey uh, or to Egypt uh, for their vacations. Uh, but many think that uh, the level of service uh, the overall infrastructure uh, is not likely uh, to match uh, that of even uh, middle-level foreign resorts. So it's a big question whether the region might uh, gain strategically uh, uh, and uh, attract uh, more tourists than uh, it, uh, uh, it has right now. I think that there is skepticism about that, though I can imagine that uh, for upper middle class uh, these ski resorts would be attractive. And uh, I can imagine that uh, they might become fashionable, so people are likely to go there. But uh, whether it's worth it, it is still an open question. Uh, Andres Evagora, uh, is it worth it is always a question asked. And I'll, I'll, in, in the past, at great expense, Olympics have been built. But oftentimes it's been watershed moments. Uh, Barcelona it was the return into the fold of a, uh, of a nation. Um, for, for many countries, it's an important change of status. Even for South Africa, you might argue, for the World Cup, where uh, it put, uh, to a certain degree, Africa on the map. It's a lot of money, but it is important for a nation's prestige. Well, the Russians obviously do see it for their prestige, but also strategically. Remember, these Olympic Games are just a few kilometers from the Georgian border. Uh, we know what was happening in that part of the world uh, around 2008, 2009. I mean, it's not just to create a new ski resort. Uh, Another question you could ask was 2006 when they won the games, who'd heard of Sochi? I mean, no disrespect, I don't think I had. Now it's making the headlines around the world. Come on, 50 billion, of course, it's a balmy amount to spend on, on some curling and, and downhill skiing. It's more than has been spent on all the previous Winter Olympics combined. It's more than even the Chinese spent. Whether it will be worth it, well, we'll see in a couple of weeks, but going back to your question, the Russians do have to learn to manage some some scandals that will inevitably come over the next two weeks uh, and building the infrastructure has been very difficult from scratch but now their job is to handle the uh, the image of it and the the, the media relations 
which is going to be very difficult because journalists from around the world will be looking for some stories uh, apart from the bobsleigh and the curling. There's no doubt about that. And so let me ask you, Andres, it's a question put by Alfred on Twitter. Are Sochi Games really that different from other Olympics? Well, from a technical point of view, there's a few new sports, but it's not really, it's not groundbreaking, that, but they're on a huge scale. Um, it, just from a media point of view, that for instance, they're going to be broadcast around Africa for the first time, the Winter Olympics. There are more journalists than any other Winter Games. And even in my home country, Britain, there's more, far more interest in winter sports than there has before. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some fantastic performances. It'll be the most expensive Games ever. But we'll know in a couple of weeks whether Putin's gamble will be worth it. Elena Servitas, uh, what do you think? That you, you heard there Andre Kordokov say... The, the sums of money when there's a lot of zeros, people, they don't, it's not this something is, that registers. Su surprising. Point yeah. taken? I, I mean, for, for me, it's, uh, he, he told that it, do, it doesn't affect them uh, personally. Of course, it, it, it affects $50 billion uh, it not, that people um, will not uh, get their, I mean, uh, salaries, not, they, they will not, this money will not be spent to medical care and all, 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 all these things, uh, you know, this is a state money. For example, if you just uh, make a sample, uh, calculation about the stadium, this stadium uh, for the opening, there is 40,000 people for, for this stadium, and they say the stadium will cost us $200 million. In fact, we spend seven, seven, uh, 780 million. So it means that each fund, each, uh, each place, it costs like 19,000 uh, and a half. So it means, you know, 19,000 and a half for each uh, person, it's, it's really too much. Why, do you exp why is it that it's gone over budget? What is your, what is your thinking on that? It's, uh, it's an interesting question because the estimation was this amount of money and they said we spend this money. So I can imagine that there is something going on. So this money goes somewhere. So this is a question where it goes. Where's the money gone? Or, or Joshua Yaffa is the better question to ask, who's footing the bill? Well, that's right. Uh, the Russian government likes to talk about the participation uh, of private investors, uh, a group of uh, oligarchs who are funding uh, projects of one sort or another, whether it's a ski resort that will be used for downhill events or a renovation of the airport or the construction uh, of the Olympic Village. Uh, but even when you look at this so-called private money, which in and of itself, even in the government's own version, uh, makes up uh, just a percentage of the overall uh, funding. Even if you look at this private money, it's really coming, uh, much of it, in the form of loans uh, from state uh, banks. And then uh, when you look at future profitability uh, of these ventures and will these private uh, business uh, businessmen in Russia be able to pay back on those loans, will their investments pay off? Will, for example, the ski lift uh, ski resort in the Caucasus Mountains uh, get enough tourists so as to be profitable. And if it doesn't, will they default uh, on those loans? There's already talk of having them be uh, restructured, um, a uh, tax, certain tax incentives or, or better loan terms being given to these uh, private investors, really at the costs uh, of these state banks and potentially, therefore, at the cost of uh, the Russian taxpayers. So I think in the years leading up to the games, we didn't necessarily see a lot of attention uh, in Russia at about uh, uh, in terms of the kinds of sums involved, who was footing the bill, and where the money is going. Now the game's just on us. I'm seeing more of this conversation among Russians asking, "How much did I spend personally? Was it worth it?" And I think those questions uh, and conversations are really going to only intensify during the games and after. Uh, and, and so, Joshua, the, 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 the I guess the follow-up question to, to that is, will it come back to haunt Vladimir Putin this? I, I think that it's too early to say. Uh, again, a lot has to do, as our, uh, the other guests have, have talked about, how the games are seen uh, domestically, internationally. Are they deemed to be a success? Is it something uh, that Russia can feel uh, proud about? I think that will go a long way to determining what Russians uh, think about, was it worth it? Uh, in terms of uh, the cost of the Russian budget and to them uh, as Russian uh, taxpayers. Um, and I think uh, also the long-term legacy of the infrastructure and facilities uh, built in Sochi will also determine that. Uh, will they, have they been built uh, with, uh, of a high quality? Uh, will they last uh, if we're starting to see things uh, either fall apart or simply go unused because there isn't enough demand in the coming years? I think that that will really sharpen opinions uh, negatively toward the games. But if 
Putin pulls off uh, building uh, an in-demand ski resort in the Caucasus, uh, that may have people uh, thinking favorably. So ultimately, I think it's just too early to say uh, what uh, inside Russia the long-term legacy uh, of the games will be. All right. Well, we have seen, and it's been uh, talked about a lot uh, in the press the last week, is the region where uh, Sochi uh, is located. The Krasnodar Krai region has grown an average of 7% a year, making it one of the fastest growing in all of Russia. This in the period from 2006 to 2011. Investment in infrastructure has boomed. Uh, but as uh, Andrei Kordinov, some of the panelists uh, have said, uh, uh, the problem is uh, after the games are over, this infrastructure reverts to the local councils, and they're saying already that they can't afford to keep them up. Well, uh, you know, of course, it is a problem, and I don't think that with addition, without additional subsidies, uh, you'll be in a position to maintain this infrastructure. Uh, of course, Putin uh, is trying to do something uh, in order to use the infrastructure for other purposes. Uh, for example, uh, right uh, after the Olympic Games uh, in the beginning of summer of this year, uh, this uh, location uh, will host uh, the G8 summit. Uh, it will also host uh, the summit between Russia and the European Union a little bit earlier. Uh, so definitely there is an intention uh, to turn this whole place uh, into a large uh, conference facility, uh, something uh, that can be used uh, to accommodate uh, large-scale meetings, uh, exhibitions, conventions, uh, you name it. Uh, it's not going to uh, make use of all the infrastructure, uh, and uh, there are some facilities uh, which are unlikely to be fully utilized simply because there are certain sports which are not that popular in Russia. So it's a big question uh, how you can uh, 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 use uh, uh, these particular objects and uh, how you can manage them without uh, major infrastructural subsidies from state. I think that what will happen uh, after the Olympics, uh, uh, the heads of the uh, regional and uh, municipal authorities will approach uh, the president and will try to get uh, additional money from the president, uh, making the point uh, that uh, if uh, he doesn't provide additional funding, the infrastructure is likely to decay. Uh, and uh, his major investment will be inflated. And will he get the money? Well, I think that uh, it's quite possible uh, that uh, if uh, we don't have major budget constraints, uh, some additional money uh, will come. But let me just make one point uh, regarding the uh, taxpayers. You know, the, uh, the, the, the peculiarity of Russia is that uh, in this country, uh, we have one of the lowest uh, income taxes in the world. It's a flat tax of 13%. And the money which is used uh, to build all this infrastructure, in most cases, uh, came not from uh, the taxes that we as citizens of Russia pay, but Russia, but rather uh, from uh, uh, revenues generated uh, through the export of hydrocarbons. That's why, you know, people do not feel that as taxpayers, uh, they can uh, really uh, keep the government accountable. And this is one of the problems, not just with the Olympic Games, but uh, with the federal budget at large. People simply, at least many people, do not feel that they have the right uh, to uh, have a say in how this money is used. And, 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 and the question then is whether or not uh, th that's going to change. Uh, on, uh, on Twitter and Facebook, the viewers showing tough love, it seems, for the hosts of these games. Uh, we have one comment here. The Olympics is like when your crush is coming over and you clean up your room, except with poverty and corruption. That's uh, uh, one of the comments uh, we, we've received. Uh, again, back to the question of the image of the games, uh, which uh, has been dented uh, before it starts. And talking just now about uh, what happens afterwards. Elena Servataz, the Russian president, undeniably still a very popular man in his own country, um, up to now, you heard there what uh, Andrei Kordunov said, taxes are low in Russia overall. The issue of, uh, of how the money is handled, is it really going to be that much of an issue coming in the years to come in Russia? I don't know. It's correct about the 
the taxes. It's 13%, but also don't forget the salary is much, much lower than in Europe. So you cannot, you cannot really compare. And uh, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I also, I'm not agree that people never ask themselves where the money is coming from for this Olympics. I saw many families displaced with small children living in uh, garages or something, you know, kind of boxes. They were displaced there and they told, okay, we have uh, plenty of diamonds around, but we are living now in, uh, in, in conditions which are not human. And so they lost their houses and they do not ask questions. I'm sorry, I, I don't believe that. They already prepare their um, claims for European court because in Russian court they will never win such a, such a process. Uh, the uh, the issue of the displaced, is it something that's uh, uh, popped up on the news inside of Russia, Joshua Yaffa? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about some of uh, the side effects uh, of the games, whether they've been environmental or ecological. That's been a big issue uh, with uh, what started as really the crusade of environmental activists down in Sochi, catching some uh, broader resonance, um, as well as this issue uh, of those displaced. I think uh, it, it's an issue that has immediate uh, understandability or resonance uh, to a lot of Russians, the idea that uh, an all-powerful state can come in and cause some disruption of your life uh, without much legal recourse. Uh, I think that that's something, uh, that's a narrative uh, that many Russians would find um, familiar or at least recognizable. Um, so that's an issue that, ha that has gained um, some traction. But really, I think the Olympics and the preparations for the Olympics were something that had been happening, uh, if not quietly, a bit unnoticed, at least by the majority of Russians, uh, certainly the, uh, aside for those living down in and around Sochi itself, uh, for several years. It hasn't been until the last months, weeks, and now days, really, with the Olympics right upon us that I think a lot of these big questions, kind of buried questions, uh, from really a history of seven years uh, of construction are now coming to the fore. And suddenly you're seeing a lot of conversations uh, in Moscow around Russia about these games, how the games uh, were built. Uh, and, and I think it's a conversation having begun uh, with just weeks and now days to go before the Olympics is really going to continue uh, it, in the weeks and months to come. It's interesting that you say that because uh, the conversation about uh, building infrastructure in Sochi mirrors a wider conversation. We're now seeing Rus growth in Russia's economy plummeting from 3.4% in 2012 to just one4 percent uh, last year. Uh, the main blame, uh, according to one piece we read in the Financial Times, uh, uh, it, Joshua, is uh, problems of business investment. People don't are, are not investing and they're not investing in infrastructure inside of Russia. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. Whether or not so to be able to fix that uh, is a different question. Uh, certainly, some of the infrastructure uh, and transport problems in Krasnodar, the region where Sochi is located, uh, have been greatly improved. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, anything for uh, transport or infrastructure uh, in Siberia, in the far north, in the far east, uh, and so on. I think Russia has a tradition. And in this way, you could say that uh, modern Russia or today's Russia has uh, inherited, at least partially, or in this particular way, uh, the legacy of the Soviet Union. And that's in, in terms of thinking of development in large, not just large, but, but mega scale uh, projects. We saw this last year, actually, uh, with the APEC summit held uh, in Vladivostok. Uh, Vladivostok, up until last year, was the recipient of a huge amount uh, of uh, federal budget money going to build uh, all manner of infrastructure, including a now infamous uh, $1 billion bridge uh, to an island off the coast of Vladivostok. Uh, so I think that that's how Putin-era Russia thinks uh, of developing infrastructure, uh, not piecemeal, not a little bit here and there, but really mass mobilization uh, projects. Uh, the, in the long-term impact of that, how efficient and effective uh, it is, is something we'll see again, as, we, as all our guests uh, have been saying tonight uh, in the coming years. Andre Kortinov, what can Vladimir Putin do to encourage people to invest more in Russia? We've seen uh, with uh, things like the Yukos scandal that it's scared away of a lot of investors. Well, there are many issues uh, that uh, have to be addressed. Uh, uh, we need uh, to have independent courts, and many doubt that uh, we have independent judiciary in this country. Uh, we have to do something about uh, red tape, about bureaucracy, 
uh, we need uh, to be more consistent, much more consistent in confronting in the and uh, confronting corruption. And the big question is whether you can do all that when you do not have a competitive political environment, whether indeed uh, you can manage it uh, within the framework of the current political system. Andreas Evagora, is this going to be a moment we saw last summer? Because it's amazing, because over the last 12 months, we've seen Vladimir Putin's star power wax and wane. Remember when Barack Obama went to that G20 summit in St. Petersburg, Putin was the man of the day uh, because he had gotten the Americans to back off the idea of strikes on Syria. Uh, how will he be at, the, at these Olympics? Will he be a cornered man or will he be again, will this be his moment of glory? Cornered, I doubt it. But the issues we're talking about are, are not really any, they're not really isolated to Russia. Look at Brazil and the next World Cup in the Olympics. We're seeing exactly the same thing. Displaced people, corruption in major contracts, politicians trying to use a sporting event to help themselves both domestically and internationally. So there's nothing really specific to these games about that. We saw it in London. And going back to your question about what it will do to the Russian economy, we really do need to wait a few years. Let's look back at Greece, 2004, Athens Olympics. People thought, well, you know, this is showing uh, the Greeks at their very best. It was that way for a couple of years. Now most people see it as the beginning of the end of the Greek economy, 2004. So one thing's for sure, the attention will all be on, on Vladimir Putin and Russia over the next few weeks. The effect we probably won't see for a few years, but it's a big opportunity for him as well, because as you say, he's, he's making the headlines all over the world and he will do for the next couple of weeks. What do you think is his biggest, um, the number one thing he should be worrying about during these games? Well, what he's obviously worried about is a, is a terror attack, not necessarily in Sochi, but it could be around anywhere in Russia. And I know there's worries that it might be in Moscow, it might be in Volgograd, because, of course, we've talked about problems in Sochi, but that will pale into insignificance if the security of the country um, is being seen to be threatened by this event. I mean, around Sochi, I spoke to people in Sochi this morning. I mean, there's so much security. It's very difficult to get in and out, but the vast country that Russia is, he has to protect that, not just uh, the small part of southwest Russia that, that we're talking about. Joshua Yaffa, you agree? I'm sorry? Joshua Yaffa, do you agree that uh, it's security the number one issue during these games? I, I think that that absolutely is uh, the concern that rises uh, above all others. In other words, uh, there can be uh, talk about costs. Uh, there can be talk about the long-term uh, use of some of these uh, venues uh, and some of the infrastructure. But if, if Putin and the Russian state can't uh, provide a, a, a degree of security, if there is uh, a terrorist attack, uh, I think that that really, more than anything, uh, will uh, spoil the mood of the games, the image of the games, and really just be a, a tragedy uh, uh, for not just Russia, but really for all countries uh, sending athletes to the games. So I think that uh, concerns over security rise to uh, a different degree um, than even uh, this talk we've seen in the past couple of days about hotels uh, not ready uh, for arriving journalists or being uh, in, in poor condition and so on. I think that that stuff certainly doesn't make uh, Russia look good and is already uh, spoiling a bit of the celebratory atmosphere uh, with a couple of days to go. But I think that nothing uh, is as uh, a fun central fundamental importance uh, like security. I forgot to ask you this, Andreas Evagor. Who's going to be lighting the Olympic flame? We still don't know. It's a secret. Um, we know who will be the flag bearers. We know pretty much everything about it. But that's kept a real secret till the morning. We've the latest rumors, rumors are that it might be a certain friend of Vladimir Putin who is an excellent rhythmic gymnastic. So, so I'll, I'll uh, let your viewers look into that because I don't want to get myself into trouble with uh, the president of Russia. Uh, Andrei Kortinov, have you heard the same rumor? Well, uh, I prefer not to comment on that. <laughs> Elena Servitas, you, what, 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 is, what are you expecting from these games? Um, I just wanted to go back to the question of security, if you allow, because there is this question about terrorist attack, or also there is the question about the security of the infrastructure, because there is 65,000 people who came from Central Asia, and they have been working there with a condition, with difficult condition, and so they were not paid, and we were asking ourselves if they worked um, in a proper way, or will it go like it should be? So maybe something will broke. I hope not. So uh, all these questions also were raised. All right. Before we go, just tell you the same UK brewery 
that uh, brought you uh, organic Viagra-laced beer to celebrate the royal wedding in 2011, is now serving up a limited edition Hello, My Name is Vladimir beer. Um, in it, it says, uh, 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 on the back on the label, gasp as I ride semi-naked on horseback through the Siberian tundra and straight down your throat. I am 100% hetero and will pass laws to prove it. A bit of tongue-in-cheek fun uh, about those new anti-gay laws that have been sparking uh, demonstrations. That's where we're going to leave uh, this edition. I want to thank our guests, Andrei Kordunov and Joshua Yaffe in Moscow. I also want to thank... Uh, uh, Elena Servitas and Andreas Evagora, thank you for joining us here on the France Enquête today.